well-known electronic names here. <clears throat> Here's one by Canon. There's a JVC. This is a Mitsubishi. This is a Sanyo. There's a Sony. Over there is a Toshiba. And this one is from Hitachi. They are part of a group of 17 different machines from 17 manufacturers where, although the machines themselves look rather different one from another, they all have one thing in common. Three letters. M S X. MSX stands for the operating system on which they all work. Now that's very interesting because what it's supposed to do is to give these machines what's called software compatibility. Or if you would like that in English, it comes down to this. It means that I should be able to whip the cartridge out of this one, swap it with the cartridge that's in this one, plug it in properly. Here we go. Swap that one into there and the programs will run without any problem on the other machine. And you can do that with all the MSX machines in the range, which, as you can imagine, is a significant commercial threat indeed to European and United States computer manufacturers. So significant that we hear rumours that Philips are about to launch their own MSX machine and further rumours that other manufacturers here in the West are following the MSX route because it does provide a significant commercial advantage. While I was in Japan, I asked some of the people behind MSX why they had gone for a common operating standard. I feel that the quality of software that's out there today is, is far, far short of what's possible and what's necessary to be able to go out to someone and say, yes, you should buy a computer and use it in your home. Frankly, the home market isn't tapped. We're still only selling to the people who are curious or um, worried that their kid might fall behind. And uh, we have to encourage innovation in the most important area which is the, the software area, and MSX is an incredible aid to that. Also, on, on the hardware side, by having a standard interface between software and hardware, where the, the hardware is very high volume, the chip companies can go off and build specialized chips that take the functions that originally on MSX are being done with 20 chips and slowly but surely work that down to a single chip so the price of the product can be low enough that it will be built into the TV set someday. Does the introduction of MSX, in your view, represent a move towards very many fewer computers using fewer systems? Well, yes, that's absolutely the, the key to MSX. There's, uh, it's kind of what we call Tower of Babel, uh, where you end up with a lot of software instead of, of uh, you know, a few very, very good focused packages that, that really sell in high volume. Um, Everyone agrees that there will be fewer computer standards. And in the U.S. market at, at the high end, um, the so-called IBM PC compatibles are, are reducing the amount of variety there. In the very low end, uh, MSX will reduce the amount of variety. Instead of all these MSX manufacturers having different machines, they all have compatible machines. So over time, there will be some consolidation to allow the software industry to do what it has to do. One thing to keep in mind about MSX is there's actually quite a bit of variety. Uh, on top of the base level standard, people can put in their, their own extensions, whether it's music or uh, videotape interface, and uh, the amount of memory that's built in, the way the keyboard's done, allows for substantial variation while maintaining the ability to run the same software. And so people should look around as, as these come out and decide which one is most appropriate. There is a small computer called a video game computer. There is a home computer. There is a personal computer. There is a small business computer. There is an office computer. MSX has been designed with the architecture of these high-end machines and uh, stripped down to low end. So this is a very continuous growth. So customer can even upgrade the game machine to be a personal business machine. It has been only computer company who has been making personal computers but there's a lot of other uh, electronics company who has been interested who uh, would like to integrate computer function into their own dedicated consumer products uh, company like uh, Panasonic and Sony uh, they are large in producing television set then they are deciding to put a computer capability into the television set. And in the case of uh, Yamaha, uh, they are very uh, large keyboard manufacturers. They would like to integrate a computer into a keyboard.
lot of new consumer products coming, like a compact disc, the video disc, video tape, uh, music stereo, keyboard. A lot of electronic consumer products is going to be integrated. Of all the new Japanese computer products, the most closely watched is MSX. Aimed primarily at the home market, MSX is an operating system designed by Kei Nishi to solve the problem of incompatible machines. MSX is a standard for 8-bit machines, and no matter who manufactures the computer, if it runs on MSX, it will run any software written for MSX. The reason why I think MSX is going to have uh, a very important uh, significance among the industry is looking back the history of consumer products. All the consumer product success is multiple hardware vendor and multiple software vendor. There has been no consumer products that has uh, established only with single source of the vendor. And the beauty of this product is we have a very clear separation of software and hardware. MSX is a hybrid of Eastern and Western technology. Although made in Japan, it was designed in the United States. While MSX is still an unknown factor, it points to Japan's unconventional approach to a routine obstacle, compatibility. In fact, if the Japanese made machines to the IBM standard, it would just lead to a kind of price war. It would not improve anything. Instead, the Japanese companies are trying to produce machines with higher standards, a higher level of functions. The bigger the gap between Japanese and American computers, the better the chances are for new Japanese machines. Stuart, it looks like there are a lot of manufacturers in different countries that like to bring computers onto the shore, but it really is a Japanese challenge that our manufacturers are concerned about. We're going to talk about that next, Gary. We have Michael Miller with us now. Michael is the West Coast editor of Popular Computing Magazine. And next to Michael is Christopher Mead, the editor and publisher of the Japan High Tech Review based in Phoenix, Arizona. Chris, in various publications we've seen uh, computer systems that have been very successful in Japan, such as the Sharp X1 or MSX, that have not come onto our shores, that haven't been introduced in the United States. What's the reason for that? I think the basic reason is really just language. First of all, the Japanese language is so complicated with the characters or kanji which need to be represented uh, graphically. It requires more computer power to do that than just the, the Western alphabet. This has meant that un until just a year or so ago, it was impossible to have the Japanese language on personal computers. This kept them far behind our industry in their development of personal computers. Now what about their local uh, customer base? You know, they've got there's quite a few million people in Japan. Is there, a, is there a, let's say, some uh, intention to sell into that market first and then come on into the United States? Do you feel that at all? Well, I think that's been true in, with many Japanese companies as sort of a traditional viewpoint that you don't want to embarrass yourself outside before you first perfect your product at home. Mm -hmm. There's part of that. The other problem is, of course, uh, I alluded to the Japanese language. We also have the English language problem. With software, it's a tremendous advantage to speak the language of the people you're selling to. So there's also the conversion of just the manuals and documentation and the program themselves into, into English. Uh, Michael, what about, let's, let's take uh, MSX as another example. Now, that's, that is a machine that could compete, let's say, with a Commodore 64. Has Commodore and Atari, have those two companies uh, kept uh, MSX out? Well, MSX is really a standard that will be adhered to if it exists by a number of Japanese companies. Many of these machines were shown in January at the Consumer Electronics Show, and many of them are being marketed in, in Japan. But as of yet, nobody's brought them over here successfully. Transplanting 
Japanese built software to American market, uh, I th I mean, especially applications software, I, I think it's very hard. And uh, there is no established technology about writing operating systems or, or communication software, not much in Japan. And I think I was wondering what is the reason why there is such a difficulty. And my conclusion is it is impossible to ask Japanese to speak English, right? The computer is invented in the United States. And it is impossible for Japanese people to, well, they can copy the, the inventions. But really, inventions, uh, there must be some sort of the fashion or style or history. Kazi Konishi is a lot like Paul and I. That is, he was an independent thinker. He'd seen the microprocessor and what it could do. He and I met, and we found that we had a common view that the computer could do amazing things. And he thought we should start working with these Japanese hardware companies, because there were many of them. We started without any agreement. Later, we wrote a one-page agreement and sent it over to me. And said, I mean, I don't even read, and I signed. That was the beginning. 